Hello and welcome to this bonus episode of the Tillage Edge, bringing you our virtual crop walk from Oak Park. Because of COVID-19, our normal crop walk couldn't take place, but instead we're able to bring you an interactive version. And this bonus episode is covering spring barley. We'll hear from Kieran Collins in a moment, but first out in the fields was Johnny Hogan, Oak Park's farm manager, to give us an idea of how spring barley is looking like at the moment. Here we have a crop of spring barley. The variety is gangway. It was sown on the 24th of March in ideal conditions. As we know, we had a good dry uh, March and excellent conditions for sowing. We drilled in at 176 kilos per hectare, which was uh, 360 seeds per square metre down the spout and we got a great establishment of 95% which is 342 plants per metre square so we're very happy with the establishment and then we applied our normal P and K uh, maintenance dressings and it's an index one soil for nitrogen so it's a maximum of 135 kilos of N which is 108 units and we have that already applied. On the 23rd of April we went with our weed control which was Galaxy at a litre per hectare and Cameo Max at 45 grams per hectare. We did not include an aphicide as we felt it was not necessary. Uh, it's the nearly March zone crop. And you can see we've got excellent weed control. You can see very well hit so we're very happy with that. Now we have quite a clean crop at the moment. It's tailoring nicely. No disease pressure there at the moment. But the question now is when do we go with our fungicide and can we incorporate in our wild oak control spray with that? Okay, thanks very much, uh, John. That's a, a great overview again of the crops. Um, I'm joined here now by uh, Kieran Collins. And Kieran, I just wanted to kind of go through some of the questions again that Johnny's after asking. Um, they're all kind of very pertinent for crops that are out there at the moment. Um, the first one is just in terms of the timing for the first fungicide. Yeah, I suppose it's, it's, it's a very important question and I suppose to answer it, we kind of, I'm just going to go back a little bit and look at the fundamentals of yield and where is that yield going to come from in barley. Stephen spoke about wheat there a while ago and we know with lower ear numbers we can compensate with grain weight. That's not something that we can do with barley, so how we maximise yield in barley is trying to maximise the number of grains per square metre and we influence that by obviously having as many ears per square meter as we can. So the object or the aim of the first fungicide really is to protect those lower tillers. And as those lower tillers, if we can protect those from disease, that will actually give us, um, help those tillers to survive, which will help us to maximize the, the number of ears. So I suppose then to directly answer the question in terms of timing, you know, there was experiments carried out here a number of years ago, Shea referred to it there earlier on, in relation to timings. And I suppose when you look at the first timing at this stage here that I, that I have here, main stem with two good tillers on it, so mid to late tillering, versus an application at stem extension, they found that there was up to 0.3 of a ton per hectare of a difference. And when you add that to the potential that you can get from that final fungicide as well, that could be half a ton per hectare of an advantage in bringing that program forward by, by two weeks. So you're, you're talking about mid to late tillering and a final one, as Shea described earlier on, on emergence, versus we we'll say waiting for stem extension and that ear to be fully out. So to, to a degree, the early bird is going to get the worm immediately out early to, 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 to get the stem. Yeah, absolutely. And it's all about protecting those lower tillers, you know, from, from foliar disease. Okay, I suppose it's a similar question uh, to, to maybe uh, I've asked the other lads here this evening. What sort of products should, should we be using? Um, again, it's a year that's dry, price of barley, do mm. we need to spend as much? Absolutely, and I suppose talk about the timing. If, if in, a, in a disease, in a year where there's high disease pressure, if you can save, you know, 0.5 of a ton per hectare, getting those timings right, you know, that would almost pay for the fungicide program. So in terms of products, I suppose the first thing we need to look at is the level of disease in the crop. So it's simply getting into the crop, having a look around, see what level of disease is there, and then obviously what, what diseases are there. And also to refer to the recommended list, I'm very fortunate here, we have a very strong program on by the Department of Agriculture, very solid figures in terms of susceptibility to disease. So, you know, that you, you accumulate that data and then you, you, you put your program together from there. But essentially what we're looking at is using a mix of actives, you know, um, that target, you know, the key disease. So if we're talking about a crop like, like John had there, Gangway or maybe Planet, probably two of the biggest varieties in the country this year, both would have a five of a rating on the Department of Agriculture recommended list. So, you know, there, that's really something that you'd certainly be watching out for in those scenarios. So in terms of the fungicide program, we know the protioconazole, 
would be quite strong on Rinko as, as, as an azote. Also gives you a little bit of protection there in, in terms of mildew, if it is required, even though both those varieties would, would be an eight. But you wouldn't rely on one active alone. So you're partnering that up again with, um, with either a straw or an SDHI there. Again, an active that has activity on the key diseases, which probably will be will be Rinko in, in, in this case. And again, it's, you know, as Shay said earlier on, in relation to the to the winter barley, it's no more than, than a 50% rate of the individual actors in, in the mix. So a guy might argue that, look, it's a relatively dry year. Yes, you're talking about Rinko, which is a wet weather uh, disease. But, I mean, should I really be targeting that much? Do we even need 50%? Can I get that bit lower? Yeah, I, 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 I mean, so up to 50% or, or even more of the response can actually come from that first time. And so, again, like it, it is about getting into the crop. If, they're, if it's dry and if it's cleaner, there may be some scope maybe to, to look at, at cheaper alternatives. But I, I think the key fundamental still has to be that it use a mix of actives, really. Um, and if they're, you know, maybe search around for a bit of value in, in, in a drier year. And what sort of actives or, or products are you, are, you, are you kind of talking about? Yeah, so for Thai kind of console based, we're talking about the likes of Proline, obviously, and then combination with an SDHI and the likes of Siltra or Lattice Era would be, would be very popular. There's, you know, there's pre-formulated ones, you know, Decoy Comet there as well would be, would be probably quite a popular one as well. And from your knowledge of trials, in a relatively dry year like this, is there much of a difference between them? Does a guy really need to get, you know, very... Uh, you know, concerned that I'm using this one and not using that one. Yeah, not not particularly. And I suppose if we if we go back to 2018, which obviously was was an extreme. Obviously, the return from from fungicides in 2018 was was little or none. You know, so again, I suppose you're you're trying to balance as a part of an IPM strategy. You're trying to balance all the components, and and you are taking advantage of that that dry year if if, if it's there. Like, so would it be right in saying that? Timing is probably maybe as important, if not more important, maybe than the absolutely. Then timing is is the key. Timing is the key. Okay. It says a half ton potentially in a disease year between the the two timings. The, 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 the last question John had there, he mentioned that he did weed control. I think it was on the twenty third of April. He might have mentioned, and um, he has wild oats to control now. Um, and you kind of wonder when should he put that in? Should he put the, that, that in with a fungicide, or what's the mm. what's the best advice for that? I, I, I suppose again, um, it's getting back out into the crop, and I suppose number one, establish do I need to spray for wild oats? You know, that's the first thing. Um, having a look in the crop, obviously, field history is 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 a big one there. And I suppose you know we we, we do have a level of resistance at this stage, so you know we certainly don't want to apply. A herbicide where, where we don't need to. So I suppose that's that's the first point making that decision. Do I need to do it? Um, I suppose in in the likes of spring barley, obviously we're we're, we're quite limited in, in in terms of actives. But you know if you take the likes of Phytoxidin there, which would be in the likes of Axial Pro or or um, Avena Nova, you know you need that 21 days between the the herbicide and and the wild oat application. And I suppose what also is very important in terms of wild oats um, uh, control as well is coverage. You know, certainly if it goes a bit later, you're going to find that you're going to, you know, you're going to get more competition from the crop and you may hit the main stem and then you're in the crop next June and you're looking at these stray wild oats around the place and you're wondering what went wrong here. And, you know, if you have poor coverage, sometimes those smaller tillers escape and they come through the crop after. So I think coverage is, 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 is a huge issue as well in terms of getting good wild oat control. Okay, we have a question here from, from Cyril from the Northeast, who, who's, uh, you know, rightly, I suppose, reflecting uh, what's out there in terms of crops are under stress. Mm -hmm. And he's asking the question, should we be putting in foliar fees or something similar in with those herbicides to try and help on the crops? Yeah, it's, it's a great question because there's, there's a bit of a divide. I mean, I came from the area this morning that maybe has had an inch of rain the last two days and I came up here to Oak Park and, and the ground is dry as a bone, you know, and I know that from talking to advisors, especially in, in, in the northeast there where Cyril is, establishment was even patchy, just that that that, that soils were, were, were dry. And I suppose, you know, in terms of foliar feeds and trace elements and all that, I suppose you'd always go back number one to field history and the soil test result you know that's probably like your it's 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 like shining the light in terms of of, of showing up what what's uh, what that soil requires and this was that that would always be the first port to call obviously when you get dry conditions quite often we get these transient efficiencies that you know if we did get rain that actually alleviates a lot of that problem so i suppose to answer your question you know it's it's looking at the soil test results 
you know, is it a magnesium deficiency, is it magnesium, and sort of applying on, on, on that basis. Okay. Again, another question from, from, from Gareth, uh, and he is talking about um, minimum plant counts, and he's talking about psychosal. Is it mm. worthwhile putting psychosal on spring barley? Yeah, I, I mean, the first thing, it goes back to, to plant counts. You know, I suppose you, we're all trying to establish, you know, maybe 300 in excess of 300 plants to give us that, 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 that optimum yield. Um, where the plant count is suboptimal, below 300 or maybe even be, below 250 in, in a lot of cases, um, I suppose the first key thing, I suppose, really, before we talk about psychics so is make sure all that nitrogen is out there and, again, correct any deficiencies that are there like, like, like we just spoke about. In terms of, of, of psychocell, I suppose it may be worth trying and just be aware of labour restrictions with some of the products. But I suppose the response to trials here wouldn't be brilliant, but, you know, it, it, it may help in some sense, but don't expect a huge response. Okay. There's a question in here from John who's going back to the question that we, we kind of uh, talked about in the other two conversations about chlorotanolol. Mm. Chlorotanolol and spring barley, should we, you know, it's got, again, it's going to be gone on the 20th of, Mar of uh, May. Uh, should we be included, should farmers be included in at the T1? Because it probably won't be available for the T2. Yeah, certainly won't be available for, for, for T2. And Ramalaria, obviously, is, 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 is a big issue in spring barley, just as it is with, with, um, with, with winter barley. Um, in terms of including it at, at, at T1, I suppose the way I put it is if you have it in your store and you need to use it up and you know before the 20th of May, certainly put it in. Unfortunately, it may give some response, but it's not going to be anything near what you'd have got at that final timing. So yes, put it in if you have it and in the high disease pressure year, it may give you something, but again, don't expect a huge amount. I suppose the follow-on from that obviously is maybe what do I do in that scenario at post the 20, 20th of May, you know, as Stephen spoke about in, in wheat, uh, you know, it has to be, it has to be felt at that stage. We had a very good Ramal area trial in winter barley here last year while acknowledging that felt is obviously a long ways behind Tortallon in terms of control of Ramal area, you know, felt with maybe Protheo at that final timing certainly will we'll give some, uh, will we'll, we'll be of some use against from malaria. Okay, a useful addition. Mm. Um, just one other question here, uh, and again, it's, it's, it's around growth regulators again, uh, talking about uh, MODIS or, or MODIS, uh, or Medix Max, I should say, on the, at the first fungicide timing, mm. which again, we're talking about mid to, to, to late tailoring. Again, is that worthwhile or is it pretty much the same as, as, as Lycosol? Yeah, I, again, I, I, I suppose, you'd be very slow in putting a growth regulator on a crop that's under stress. I think that's the, that, that is the first thing really. It just, it just doesn't make sense to try, try and regulate growth in, in a crop that's already under stress. So, I, you know, from that perspective, if the crop is under stress, it's, it's an absolute no-no. I suppose if you have a healthy, actively growing crop, you know, I know some people are worried about lodging in recent years with, with, with some of the varieties we have, and I know some people have done it. It's, it's a very tricky thing to get right. Um, you know, it's probably too late now, but reducing the level of overall, overall nitrogen is probably the key um, way to, to, to reduce lodging pressure. Um, but certainly not on, on stress crops. You know, if a crop is subject to lodging or there's high, very high nitrogen on it, um, I, I think it may, be, it, it, it may be worth doing if the risk is high. Okay. We have a, a question that probably pertains to a lot of people, um, but a question from, from Peter in Donegal. And Peter is saying his crops are by the 40 stage, so they're, they're maybe a little bit behind, maybe down further south. The ground is very dry, uh, and he's going to put on um, Zypher and Harmony Max. You know, is that pretty stressful on a crop, or, or how should he approach that? Yeah, again, I suppose, um, you know, what we're looking for a weed control is the same as I spoke about the fungicides, is, is a combination of actives, you know. Um, so you want to spray a small, actively growing weed, so weeds, so I'd imagine at the four-leaf stage, you should, have, you should have good coverage at this stage. I think what you're looking at there, and, and with, a, with an eye on resistance, you need to use a rate that's high enough to control the weeds, you know, and to spray those, those small, actively growing weeds. But at the four-leaf stage, if you're spraying weeds at cotyledons and that, you may not necessarily need the full rate. So probably in that scenario, maybe reduce rates if it's at the four-leaf stage and the weeds are actively growing. Okay, I just have another question here to do with uh, wild oats and resistance. Mm. Um, it, it's, it, the, the question is around 
not seeing great control of wild oats. Mm -hmm. What's your view on resistance? Or yeah, well, Ronan Bourne uh, delivered a great paper to Tillage Conference this year on on, on his uh, PhD, and I suppose a, a very brief summary summary of it was uh, where Ronan did uh, targeted sampling in in County Wexford. Fifty percent of the the wild oats that he found were were, were resistant to either just use trade names Axial Pro or the um, or the Foxtrot. So now I suppose it was they were wild oats that you know they were, that was in June or July, so they either hadn't been sprayed or they were resistant. You know, so but you know we know that we do have resistance at this stage, and I suppose just to refer back to the to the IPM message, it's the rotation. Of, of actives, it's limited in spring barley, so it's rotation of the crop really is, is, is how you get, get over that. And I suppose again, once you've applied the, the wild oat herbicide, it's getting back out into the crop, you know, and, and just to see the recovery there and just noting it and, you know, for, for future reference. Okay. Um what do you think about um, rolling? People don't like to do it anymore, but is that kind no, of necessary? No, uh, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And, and I mean, it's something I should have mentioned. It's, it's the very important IPM, you know, measure because, you know, if, if a wild oat's not controlled by the herbicide, obviously it's going to shed seed and increase that weed seed bank and the problem gets worse and worse, you know. So, so roguing, absolutely don't leave any wild oats after you pre-harvest. And again, the, the machinery hygiene at harvest is hugely important, you know, getting in, blowing down that combine, the baler, et cetera. And it applies to all, all weeds, but, you know, to stop it dragging around your own farm. Okay. I'm going to ask you a final question before we, we go into a kind of a panel discussion. And it's a question from Connor, uh, who is living near the East Coast, and he's asking, is an aphicide necessary? Um, if a crop, I suppose, the, the way we, you, you'd summarise it really is the later the, the emergence is, the higher the risk. Okay, so, and obviously some locations then, particularly maybe further south and coastal, the, the pressure is higher. So, you know, where the crop is, is emerging maybe into, into late April, you know, you'd, you'd have to say the risk is, is much higher. But again, same as the disease, the same as the weeds, it's, you have to get out into the crop. See, do you, see, see do you find aphids in the crop? I think that's, that's the key one, really. Um, you know, we know that BYGV is, is a big yield robber. But it's, it's, you know, it's, it's not, I suppose, doing it automatically. It's that IPM again getting out, are the rates there. But certainly the risk will be much higher if a crop is emerging in say late April. That's it for this bonus episode of the Tillage Edge. And my thanks to Kieran Collins and Johnny Hogan. I'll be back with all our weekly Tillage podcasts for all your crops advice and information. Do look out for further bonus episodes covering winter wheat and winter barley from our virtual crop walk. I'm Michael Hennessy and thanks for listening.